Designed by the legendary John Moses Browning, Winchester's lever action model 1887 and pump action 1893-97 are widely considered the first successful repeating shotguns. Both of these designs were based heavily on rifles of the period, adapting, among other things, tubular magazines. While rifles have since shifted in favor of box magazines to accommodate advances in bullet and case technology, the steel and plastic shot shells we use today are dimensionally identical to the brass and paper shells of the 1800s, and tubular magazines have remained the overwhelmingly popular choice for storing and feeding these bulky, variable length, flat-ended cartridges. As a tube magazine is necessarily offset from the axis of the barrel, a shell must be shifted in line with the barrel before it can be chambered. In a shotgun, this function is performed by a device called a shell carrier. Also called a shell lifter or elevator, the shell carrier accepts a shell as it is released from the magazine. Then, as a bolt moves forward, the carrier lifts a shell, lining it up with the chamber for feeding. In the Remington 870, the carrier is held in the down position by the carrier dog follower spring, ready to accept the shell as it is released from the magazine. As the action is closed, a notch on the bottom of the slide assembly catches the carrier dog and flips the carrier up, placing the shell in line with the chamber. As the bolt closes and chambers the shell, it pushes the carrier back down, readying it for the next shell. The 870 shell carrier does its job very well, and its operation and configuration is very similar to those in countless other shotgun mods. But oddly enough, it tends to be brought up as a negative aspect of the 870's design, mostly in childish debates between shotgun enthusiasts over which model is superior. Pointless arguments on the internet are not unusual. The problem is that, through exaggeration and hyperbole, these debated minutiae have become misrepresented and passed on as major design flaws. Uninitiated individuals who are just trying to make an educated decision on which firearm would best suit them are bombarded with overblown and often inaccurate claims about inconsequential details instead of receiving legitimate information that would actually benefit them. Now, I am an 870 owner, and I'm a huge fan of these guns, but please don't take what I'm saying here to mean that I think the 870 is the best shotgun available, and you'd be stupid to own anything else. I, I honestly don't believe one system is universally the best choice for every shooter. This isn't a Highlander. There can be more than one good design on the market. The reason I'm bringing up these debated points is because I see a lot of people asking questions and getting unhelpful misinformation or exaggeration. My goal here is to be informative, and if you're in the market for a shotgun, hopefully this will give you something you can use in making your own decisions. If you're already an 870 owner, hopefully this will give you some information to make you more familiar and effective with it. A lot of the criticism is predicated on the idea that the 870's down carrier is an outdated problematic design that has since been fixed in newer models that keep the carrier out of the way when the action is closed. Well, that's not really true. This Ithaca Model 37, for example, has retracted carriers and its 1933 design predates the 870's by around 18 years. By the way, just how classy is this old Ithaca? I mean, I love my 870, but this old gun, which is also designed in part by John Browning, is just a beautifully crafted, wonderfully handling, lightweight field gun with a bottom ejection system that give it what has to be the most positive feeding and ejection I've ever seen on a shotgun. This 1966 featherweight model belongs to my dad, who got it as a gift from his dad way back when. This was the first gun I ever fired that was more powerful than a 22 long rifle. I've got some great childhood memories of the two of us taking the truck up to old clear cuts and shooting snowballs off tree stumps. I want to thank him for those good times and for letting me borrow it for this video. Back on topic though, far from being outdated, spring-loaded carriers like the 870s are also used in every other current production Remington shotgun, including the 887 and Versamax models released within the last few years. This carrier style has also been used in past and current models from other manufacturers, including Mossberg, Browning, Frankie, Benelli, Winchester, TriStar, H&R. I could go on, but this seems to be turning into a Johnny Cash song, so I'll spare you my singing. Suffice it to say that this is a very popular design, far from obsolete or ineffectual. An off-sided theoretical fault of this style of shell carrier is that it will snag gloves or fingers when loading shells. I can't speak for all shotguns, but on the 870, the only way you can snag an entire finger in that little gap is if you jam it all the way into the magazine, which obviously isn't the most effective loading technique. 
As for gloves, while it is possible for loose fabric to be held between the shell base and the carrier, it will usually slip right out fairly easily. All the surfaces involved are smooth metal. There's nothing stopping the shell from moving forward, and the tip of the carrier actually moves away from the shell as it drops back down. So there really isn't much of a pinching action going on. A much more effective way for a glove to be caught when loading a shotgun is to snag it on the shell latch, between the latch and the shell base. Of course, this can occur on most any tube-fed shotgun, whether the carrier is up, down, or not even in the gun. Ultimately, any dexterous function, not just reloading, will be hampered to some extent by gloves. For that reason, I don't like to wear gloves while I'm shooting, but if you do, Expect to put in some additional practice time and make some adjustments to your technique, whatever style of carrier your gun has. Another misconception is that this type of shell carrier significantly limits the speed with which the gun can be loaded. The argument is that since it must be pushed aside for each shell, a shotgun with an out-of-the-way carrier, like a Mossberg 500 series, High Standard Flight King, or this Ithaca 37, can always be loaded more quickly. The truth is, with proper technique, pushing the carrier out of the way doesn't really constitute an extra step in the process. By applying force at the front of the shell, or starting it at an angle, the carrier is pushed aside and the shell is inserted into the magazine all in the same motion, without adding time. As you can see, the real limiting factor is not pushing the shell carrier aside, it's getting the next shell under my thumb to feed it into the magazine. Loading this Ithaca, it's the same bottleneck. While I'm on this topic, as I mentioned before, the force required to push the shell carrier up is determined by the weight of the carrier dog follower spring. A commonly recommended upgrade for certain 870 models is to replace the carrier dog follower spring with the heavier spring used in the police trigger plate assemblies. The heavier spring will make the carrier function a little more positively, but it will also make the shell carrier stiffer to push aside for loading. Most folks will never experience any issues with a standard weight spring, so this upgrade may not be ideal for everyone. However, if you don't like how the heavier spring feels, you can always put the original one back in. At only $3.20 each, you're not risking much if you want to just try it out. Now granted, having to push aside the carrier does make for a more involved loading procedure. If I were to hand both of these guns to someone with no prior experience and have them try loading each one as quickly as possible, they probably would have an easier time with something like this Ithaca, but much like how a brand new driver will have an easier time operating a vehicle with an automatic transmission than one with a manual transmission. Just as more complex stick shift will not limit an experienced driver, a down carrier won't hold back a shooter who's willing to practice their technique. And it goes without saying that no gun will be effective if the owner is not willing to practice with it. An individual might have a legitimate preference for the simplicity of a retracted shell carrier, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that doesn't make it an objectively superior system. And just as guns with retracted carriers are arguably simpler to load, this style of carrier has some minor advantages of its own. For one, a spring-loaded carrier like the 870s helps to protect the gun's action from foreign matter. If both of these guns are accidentally dropped in the mud or snow, the covered loading port will be more protected than an open one, which could have to be cleaned out manually. Another advantage of the 870's carrier is its mechanical simplicity. The carrier is simply held down by a spring, except for when the slide assembly moves forward and mechanically flips the carrier up. This is a very straightforward, positive, and reliable mechanism. Not a lot to go wrong. Of course, there's no reason a retracted carrier couldn't also use a simple, reliable design, but they still tend to require a more complex integration with the rest of the action. In that same vein, there's no reason a down carrier couldn't use an overcomplicated, failure-prone design. Bad engineering can strike anywhere. In the case of the 870, however, the design of the carrier is as simple and robust as the rest of the gun. Even if it does malfunction somehow and completely fails to actuate, its default down position will not interfere with the rest of the action, and it would still be in place to catch a shell from the magazine. The user would then still be able to align the shell for feeding by pushing the carrier up manually. 
The rate of fire would be reduced, but the rest of the weapon's functionality would be preserved. If a retracted carrier experiences a similar failure to move from its battery position, it would be more likely to interfere with bolt movement and shell ejection, and any shells released from the magazine would just fall out of the gun. So, are these advantages really that big of a deal? I don't think so. A little extra ingress protection is always nice on a gun that will be used for rugged duty or hunting, but it's not as if guns without this type of carrier are unsuitable in those roles. These Ithaca 37s, for example, were popular military weapons back in their day and held up quite well even in hostile environments like Vietnam. And for decades, Mossberg 500 series shotguns with retracted carriers have proven themselves just as capable of harsh military service as other military shotguns with down carriers like the Remington M870 and Benelli M1014. As I said before, I'm not trying to argue that one shotgun or one type of carrier is superior. The point I am trying to make is simply that they're both viable designs. Now, some people may strongly prefer one carrier style over the other, and that's fine, again. But for most folks, it shouldn't be a major factor when it comes to picking a shotgun. It certainly wasn't for me. If the carrier feeds the shells effectively and reliably, you're good to go. Up or down is just a detail you'll get used to with practice. Now, all this discussion is about the shell carriers that have been on the 870s since before there was an internet for people to argue about it on. You may have noticed in the close-up shots that the carrier has this little cutout on it. The carriers on early 870s did not feature this cutout, and back then, this did present a legitimate design flaw. Thanks, by the way, to Pony Carmen over on the rem870.com forums for providing me with these pictures. With this original carrier design, if a shell was somehow released from the magazine when the bolt was locked forward, it would become wedged between the slide assembly and the carrier, binding the action. This event could be caused by worn or damaged shell latches, but was more likely to be the result of the user not pushing the rim of the shell past the latches when loading. As you can see here, even that user error is difficult to replicate. But the severity of the jam made up for its rarity. And folks quickly figured out that this jam could generally be cleared by holding the forend and slamming the butt of the gun hard against the ground, forcing the slide assembly over the shell and opening the action. Now the 870 isn't a fragile gun by any means, it still wasn't exactly very easy on the action, and it tended to damage the shell rim as well. Now if that didn't work, the trigger group had to be pulled out of the gun to remove the jammed shell. Even in the latter case, the jam could be addressed fairly quickly, However, while a missed bird or unbroken clay were normally nothing to cry over, this type of hang-up could be a much more serious matter for a police officer or soldier in the middle of a gunfight. So, around 1984, Remington implemented a fix to this issue in the form of a redesigned shell carrier, as well as minor updates to the slide assembly and breech bolt. They also offered these parts as a drop-in upgrade kit for older 870s. The key to this fix was this cutout in the carrier. During normal feeding, the carrier's function was unchanged, but if a shell slipped between the carrier and slide, the tab created by the cutout could flex outward, taking pressure off the slide assembly and allowing it to move over the shell with relative ease. Instead of rough treatment or disassembly, the jam could now be cleared just by pumping the gun normally. This was a very well-engineered solution on the part of Remington. Shell jams are now a trivial problem at worst and operation, design, and parts interchangeability between old and new shotguns was largely unaffected. Since the new flex tab carrier allows the action to function relatively easily with a shell on the carrier, it also makes possible the use of a technique called ghost loading, or carrier loading, which I'll demonstrate here. Now, before I start, I really hope I don't have to remind you to use snap caps, dummy shells, or empty holes to practice this at home, but I'll say it anyway. Do not do this with live ammo unless you're at a proper shooting area with the gun pointed in a safe direction and you're confident in your ability to safely perform a ghost load. There are way too many videos out there of people showing off these and other techniques by cycling and chambering live ammunition in their homes. It always makes me cringe to imagine that a slug or round of shot could be pointed directly at a family member, neighbor, or innocent bystander. This is obscenely irresponsible. A negligent discharge in a populated area would likely earn them a charge of reckless endangerment, and if, God forbid, they were to accidentally injure or kill someone, they could be charged with assault, manslaughter, or in some jurisdictions, even second-degree murder. 
above and beyond criminal charges and punishments, they would have to deal with the consequences of their negligence for the rest of their lives. If you want to practice at home, that's great. Just do it responsibly. Spend a little money on snap caps or dummy shells, or make some of your own and use those. Now with that out of the way, in this configuration, this A70 has a five shell capacity, or four plus one. One in the chamber, and four in the magazine. As you can see, there is still some space remaining in the magazine, but not quite enough to accommodate a fifth shell. However, on some shotguns with a down carrier, like the H70, it is sometimes possible to load an extra shell so that it sits partially on the shell carrier. The first step is to make sure you'll actually be able to ghost load your gun by seeing how far the extra shell can be inserted into the magazine. You'll need to be able to fit most of the shell into the magazine for this to work properly. Depending on your magazine configuration and the shells you're using, this may or may not be possible. If you don't seem to have the space, don't force it. You could damage your gun. To perform the ghost load, first ensure your chamber is clear and your safety is engaged. Load up the magazine. Then open the action part way. Press the shell in the magazine past the shell latch to keep it in there. And open the action the rest of the way. Next, place your shell directly in the chamber if you want to have one chambered. Now, with the gun pointed slightly down to keep the shell in the chamber, close the action about halfway, far enough that the shell carrier flips up, then pops back down on its own. Then, slowly bring the forearm back, opening the bolt most of the way. You need to have the action open to have room to place the last shell, but if you bring it back too far, the slide assembly will re-engage the carrier dog and the shell carrier will come back up when you close the action again. If you hear a click, you've gone too far and you'll need to half close the action and bring the bolt back again. Once you have the carrier staged and the action open, drop the sixth shell through the ejection port onto the carrier. Using your thumb or finger, reach in and push a shell into the magazine tube as far as you can. You move the carrier from below to help line things up. Holding the shell pressed into the magazine, close the action as far as you can, then slip your thumb or finger out. If you did everything right and had enough extra room in the magazine, the shell base will slide back between the slide assembly and the shell carrier and you'll be able to close the action the rest of the way. Again, if things feel like they're hanging up, don't force the action closed. The shell room probably didn't make it under the slide assembly and you'll have to open the action and try again. But with the right technique, I now have six shells loaded in an 870 configured for four plus one. Now remember, these are all snap caps. Now, I know somebody is going to watch this and think, cool, I'll be able to have an extra shell on my home defense gun, or zombie gun, or whatever. I want to stop that right now. Ghost loading is not a recommended technique for any critical role. Well, the 870 is a very robust gun, and the flex tab carrier does its job quite well. This is still not how the gun was designed to function. There's a very slight chance that ghost loading a shell can cause the gun to malfunction at a critical moment. If you want more capacity, install a magazine extension. Don't stake your life on a technique you can't fully rely on. By immobilizing the carrier, a ghost loaded shell also interferes with changeovers and other shooting techniques. Not to mention it can get you in hot water if you use it to avoid magazine capacity limitations for hunting.
Ghost loading really isn't all that practical for most worlds anyway. It's just a fun little trick to play around with in a place like this, where there's nothing at stake. I'll say it again, do not use ghost loading for any situation where you need to be able to rely on the gun 100% or in any way that's unsafe or illegal. Well, I think I'll wrap it up here. This video is probably already long enough. Still, I hope you found it informative, and if you have any questions about what I've gone over here, I encourage you to ask in the comments. As always, until next time, have fun, shoot safe, and stand up and defend your right to do both.